Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Alcoholic. Welcome, anybody who's new to Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for for your kindness. Uh, Especially thank Mark for asking me to come up here and speak because uh, he is one courageous guy. He did not ask for a, a CD of mine or any background. He just called one day, and and I was about 5.30 in the afternoon. I get a lot of calls. And most of the calls I get are 0098-0092-0091, Dubai, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, uh, Europe, England, uh, Italy. I do a lot of workshops all over the world, but very seldom do I do an hour of speaking. And uh, he asked me, I thought it was a telemarketer when I saw the, uh, what is it, 206? <clears throat> so thank you. And, and I know it, it doesn't seem like it's a big job, but it is. I was a, I became a speaker together for a, we have a, we have a seminar in Las Vegas on the Thanksgiving weekend every year. We've had it for 53 or 54 years and, and I, I had just become double digit and I joined the committee and they put me in charge of getting speakers. And I got, I had a 2.30 on a Saturday afternoon and I got this guy and he showed up. I went and picked him up and he asked me for a can of uh, silly string. And I thought it was odd. Silly string, what the hell? And I thought maybe he's got family in Las Vegas. He's going to go to a kid's party. So I went to a party shop and I got him a kind of silly strings come Saturday afternoon. And if you're the speaker together, two scenarios is either right on, maybe you, you did a good job or what the heck was that? You know, and, uh, and, and I, I'm, we all, of course, we have to sit in the back of the room and listen to the speaker and, and this guy starts talking, and he goes on and on and on about his drinking, and it gets to the point where he's vomiting, and he pulls out the can of silly strings, and he's spraying the people in the two or three front rows. And, and I'm looking at my partner, Stan, like, Jesus, is that for real or what, you know? So I promise you, I don't have any props. <clears throat> I also have a day job. I'm a contractor. So I'm not going to try to be a funny guy and tell jokes. I will be talking about the uh, treatment for alcoholism. The, the, uh, I always, I told uh, Chris, I said, every time I go to the podium, which is often, uh, I take one of the books, just like a little boy with his blanket. I take one of the leather shoes with me as a security blanket. And, and in the beginning of this book, there's a par- paragraph that says, uh, the, uh, the, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are a group of uh, principles, spiritual in nature, that when practiced as a way of life, it will be expel the obsession to drink, and it will enable the, the sufferer, which is you and I, to become happily and usefully whole. And if you read the other literature, it's constantly talking about God. Lack of power was a dilemma. Uh, he, she just read it, you know, we have to have God. Uh, uh, God could, could and would if he were sought. So the whole thing is about, I suffer from a, a lack of enoughness on the inside that nothing can feel except for the uh, presence of God in my soul. Okay? So it's all about, it's all about God. And really, what is the purpose of our lives anyway? I mean, whether you come from the, uh, from a park bench or park avenue, whether you build gates with billions of dollars in, in wealth, or you come from a park bench. What is the purpose of our lives? And in here, on page 99, it basically talks about the purpose of our lives. It's the St. Francis's prayer. He says, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith. That where there is despair, I may bring hope. That where there is shadows, I may bring light. That where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to be comforted, comfort than to be comforted. 
to understand and to be understood, to love and to be loved. For it's by forgiving that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. So regardless of where we've come from, we've come from the light. We're here for a very, very short duration. We go back to the light. And what is left of you is what you've done in this short time that you've been here. From what I understand, the planet Earth is about 16 billion years old. If you were, if you were to travel in the speed of light, it will take you, they said, like 14 billion years to get from one end to the other. And then they get there and it's a, it's a black hole and they're afraid to go in because they don't know what it is. And, and, uh, seriously, that's, that's what I saw on the, the, the Discovery Channel and, and, <laughs> and, uh, so what is, what is, what is left of us is what we, what we do here in this couple of days. And if, if, uh, you know, we've come from the light and we go back to the light. In other words, eventually I become one with the light. So the question becomes, do you want to die? Till you become one with the with the force, or would you like to be become one with the force here and now, which is doable by going through the, the process of the twelve steps? It's that simple. It is that simple to become one. The twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are designed to create a sense of oneness with this magnificent force that is within us. God is within. He tells us that on page fifty-five. Of the big book, he says, uh, for deep down in every man, woman, and child is a fundamental idea of God. In the bottom of the page, he says, it is only here that he may be found. And Bill Wilson wasn't the only guy who said that. Every spiritual author of any century, they have said the same thing. Like Rumi, the Persian, per Persian poet, he said the same thing, that God is here, you know. So if, if God is here, what does it make you? A piece of God. In fact, I've written a book. Uh, the the uh, title uh, "Peace of God," and uh, uh, if you pay attention to what the book has talked about, the twelve steps of AA is about you and I getting to know self. For the simple fact, and I know every time I say that, people to refer to the book that says self knowledge is not going to keep you sober, and I know that and I get that. But knowing self is knowing God. Knowing self is knowing God. And the more I get to know self, the more I get to know God. And what is God like? What is your God like? The question becomes, what is your God like? Is your God a mean bastard who is always chasing you with a baseball bat to see if you're making a mistake so he can punish you? Is, or is your God is like my God who is so generous and loving and compassionate and, and giving and forgiving that no matter what you've done, he loves you regardless of uh, anything that you do or you've done. Okay? And it begins by step one. And I, the reason I say this is because I went through the, the uh, AA for the first eight and a half years. I had a mini spiritual awakening because I had been homeless for five and a half years. And, and, uh, uh, uh so I did, I did a lot of service and I had an awakening and I did one, two, three, twelve, one, two, three, twelve, and, I did a tiny full step, you know, one of those, one of those things that you, you write on your, you write out your life story that doesn't do a flipping thing anyway, you know, and I did that just enough so I can sound sophisticated in meetings, you know, like I'm sober that uh, six months and the topic is acceptance and I quote the book, but acceptance is the, uh, answer to all my problems and people are looking at me like, oh, who's that? Gandhi Jr.? You know, and, and I didn't know my butthole from a hole in the ground, you know. <laughs> true story, true story. And eight and a half years, uh, eight and a half years, I went through the process of the 12 steps of AA, the way it is designed in the book, the way it's designed in the book. And I have not looked back. And if I die today, it'll be fine because I know where I'm going. I'm going to go back and become one with the light. And, and like I said, I already know, I already have felt what it's like. Yes, that. And neither do you. Okay? 
And it begins by step one where it says, our body has a condition. My body has a condition that every time I take a drink of alcohol, something happens in my body that is a phenomenon. Phenomenon means unexplainable. One of the definitions of a phenomenon is unexplainable. They don't know what happens to my body that uh, you, you know your wife is standing on the curb with the baby and two toddlers uh, at the airport and just she's waiting to get picked up and you've had a drink of alcohol and your body is in charge. It is no longer a question of mental control and your body is demanding more and more and more and more and, and the lady, your wife is standing at the airport waiting for you to get picked up. That's why we're not bad people. Any Anybody new here, less than 30 days, less than 60 days a year? If you are, I want to welcome you to AA, you know? And this is not about being good or bad. It's about being afflicted with a disease called alcoholism. I came from a, a, a really, really great home with a, with a mother who was probably the most spiritual person I'll ever meet in my life. And I ended up being a homeless for five and a half years. And, and I was a pimp on 15th and Fremont in Las Vegas. And they were all my better days. It got worse from that, you know? And, uh, and um, I'd leave my house with the, uh, with the last $20 that my, my wife hands me and says, Anthony is hungry, my little boy. Uh, he was a year and a half old. He's 39 now. And, uh, and uh, he, she, she handed me a $20 bill. She said, uh, Anthony is hungry. He doesn't have any diaper. Get a, a small thing of diaper, uh, a gallon of milk, and, and, uh, and a little uh, tiny thing of hamburger meat so I can feed us. And I and I sit in the in the car, and the closer I get to the stop sign, the the, the louder this voice becomes about, well, what are you kidding me? Just go get yourself a, a you know, a, a drink, and then you can go to to Lucky's or Safeway and steal a gallon of milk. Like you know, you you can put it down your pants, and walk out. And people who's looking at you, they're saying, wow, man, this guy is gifted, you know. <laughs> And of course, I go and and uh, and I get uh, I drink, and and two hours later I come back and I'm so embarrassed and so ashamed and I hate myself for what I had just done again for the for the a thousandth time, and I, I lay in the dirt and I mess up my hair and put a couple of scratches on me and and go home and tell her I just got I got I got jumped. She goes every time you leave the house with the five dollar bill you get jumped. You know, and, and, and it's not because I was, uh, my mom, like I said, my mom and dad, they taught me every principle known to mankind. But once I take a drink of alcohol, it is no longer a question of mental control. My body is in it's, it's as if the, uh, the function of the body and the mind reverses. From what I understand, and I'm, like I said, I'm not very educated. I'm a simple, simple guy. Simple, not stupid simple, but simple in a way that uh, I believe in this power. You know, I'm, I'm very successful. And what I mean by success is not in a sense of a dollar, although I do okay, but success in a, in a sense of family, friends, AA. Uh, 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 and, I, and I believe in this magnificent force that everything is so simple. Uh, I, was, I was hanging out with a bunch of guys. Everybody was about 10 years older than me. And all of the bastards died the past five years. And I'm really lonely. I don't have anybody. So I've been talking to God. I put somebody in my path. And, and a guy came into my life who has been a friend of mine for about the past 30 years. And he was sober about 14, 14 years. He went back out. And he came back in. And he's got 15 years again. And he reached out to me about four, five months ago. And he said, maybe I want to go through the steps. And I said, OK. And, and he's a big shot in the treatment business. And he made 120000 a year. And and the treatment center went out of business, and he was uh, out of work, and he was working as a Lyft driver, Uber driver, and and uh, he's telling me, you keep talking about God. What is this God? You know, I, I need to get a job. And, and I said, Chris, do you have a God box? This is how simple I am, okay? I said, do you still have a God? You remember when we were new, they, uh, they told me to go home and make a God box, and with a little tiny slot on top, whatever you want, you just write it out. On a piece of paper, you put it in the, in the God box, and, and God will answer you. And I said, Chris, just go home and write a, get your God box out, clean it out, and, and write out whatever you want and put it in the God box. And I swear to you, he left, uh, he left Tuesday afternoon. We get together every Tuesday to go through the steps. 
about 10 minutes to 7 because he wanted to watch Jeopardy. That boy from Las Vegas who was cleaning out the Jeopardy. James. Yeah, my homeboys, man. I'm telling you, we don't, we don't mess around. And, uh, and the Thursday morning about 9 o'clock, he called me up and he goes, uh, the, they just, they just called me. And for the, the, from the moment he left, I was talking to him from here. And this is how I pray. I pray from here, from the, from the bottom of my heart, like, don't make me look like an idiot. I've been, I've been bragging about you for, for 33 years, you know. Flex your muscles and show them what you can do. And he said, okay, maybe one for, for the 50th time. Okay, and boom. He was, he was provided with the job. That kind, of, that kind of simple I am. I believe in the power of this magnificent force that is in the universe who loves you and I for no, with no expectations. He just loves us. He just made, the proof is in the pudding. You and I shouldn't even be alive. Come on. You know, how many times did you drive out in total black house that you don't have no recollection of? And yet, we're sober, we're clean, we're sitting here with a little bit of money in the bank and some dignity and integrity and family and, you know, and all of that is because of uh, the grace of this, this magnificent loving God who loves us. And I always tell people, there are three types of people that he loves with no conditions. The kids, mental patients, and of course you and I, who is basically a combination of the last two. <laughs> you know? No disrespect to you, some of you who think you're, you have arrived. You know, but you, we are. Sorry to say. Not really, but okay. So this is the condition of my body that once I take a drink of alcohol, I constantly drink, 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 drink. And the, the mind uh, the, operates in such a way that once I take a drink of alcohol, that's why the, Dr. Silkworth has talked about the condition of the body is the problem. And then, but Bill Wilson has said the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. Why did he say that? Because of the proof in the pudding. The proof is this, that I'm locked up in county jail for a year. Well, not that it wasn't my first time. I'd been there quite a few times. You know, it was like a regular visit. But this time I liked it so much, I decided to stay there for a year. And, uh, and uh, uh, I, I go there for the two weeks. I'm going out of my mind. You know what it's like when you don't have a drink for a couple of weeks? You start experiencing these intense, intense feelings of, anxiety and being restless and irritable and discontented and you're empty and desolate and lonely and you don't know which way to go and and I swear to God I, I found a way I found a way to get to get something and I started to say oh my back oh my back and they took me to the doctor it was a black guy named uh, Dr. Gregory God bless him if he's still alive and God bless his soul if he's dead because he finally told me he said dude what do you want I said, I'm going to be here for a year. Please give me something. He goes, okay. And they put me on a, on a, on an alcohol in a pill form. They gave me one in the morning and one at night. And about a month later, I became a trustee and they gave me a job in the kitchen and they gave me the key to, uh, I became the baker for Las Vegas County Jail. And I baked for a thousand inmates and officers and I had access to yeast just in case if you're a newcomer and you end up in jail. This is how you make funo, okay? A uh, little bit of yeast, a handful of sugar, some, some syrup, whether it's apple, peach, or whatever, and you set it on top of the top shelf for uh, about 10 days or 15 days, and it becomes some butt-kicking stuff. <laughs> and you drink it, and there was a guy named uh, uh, Everett, I think. He, he was going to do life. And he got really screwed up, and he was a dishwasher, and he cleaned out the dishwashing table, and they came, and they looked, and they found it. But what I'm trying to say is this. No matter what, no matter what, this mind does not stop. And you and I drink for this reason because my soul is empty, it's lonely, it's desert. It has nothing to do with alcohol. I have always, always, always felt that way. I have always, ever since I was a little boy, I felt scared, scared, afraid of just about everything. I, I was raised in a loving home. My father married my mother. They never cheated on one another. This was old school. My dad had me when he was 50 plus years old, okay? 
So it wasn't like, it wasn't like they, he was cheating or he was going out with the prostitutes or there was fights. None of that. They respected each other. And yet at the age of six or seven, I'm starting to think uh, if he was to leave us, who is going to feed us? Just fears out of no place. Fears out of nowhere. And I feel empty and I feel desolate and I feel lonely. You and I suffer from a sense of darkness in here. Okay? And the only thing that can light it up is a drink of alcohol. Okay? It, the alcohol gives us the delusion of the light, not the light itself. It gives us the delusion of the light. I was married to a lady who was very, very festive, candy, wonderful lady. And, and uh, every, every Thanksgiving, she, the turkeys went up on the walls all over the place. And the, the, the day after Thanksgiving, everything was down and the Christmas tree went up. And, and she had about 15 of these big boxes of lights and uh, the, the angels and bowls and what, whatever, you, you name it, she had it. We had the most beautiful tree every year in the, in the neighborhood. And uh, every afternoon I got home, she worked at a casino. I got home early, about 5 o'clock, which is dark uh, around Christmas time. And uh, all I had to do was flip the light switch, and the house was magnificently lit up. The lights were green and yellow and white and red and orange, you name it, and we had it. Alcohol has the same effect on you and I, on our soul. All we got to do is drink it, and you become lit up. You become lit up. It gives you the delusion of the light. That's why the book says, lack of power was our dilemma. Not that God doesn't exist in you. He does, but he's so cluttered. He's so deep within you to where he cannot get out because of what? Because of calamity, pomp, or worship of other things. I am full of resentment. I am full of fear. Although God is in me, but I, but yet I don't feel I don't feel the power of God within. So I have to generate this phony power, okay, called alcohol, and alcohol gives me the delusion of the light, and and you you feel really really on top of the world, like wow, man, I didn't know I was so good looking. Jesus, I am literally very tall, you know. You know, I I want to apologize to all the readers that they had to read like this. They set this for me because everywhere I go, they have to lower the uh, the mic because I'm short. And, and I drank and I was six foot four. <laughs> I love what alcohol did for me. That's why Dr. Silver says, you know, we were fascinated with the result produced by alcohol. We were fascinated, we were in love with the, with the result produced by alcohol. And 21 years later, no matter what I did, no matter how much I drank, no matter what I mixed with it, it just wasn't working. It just wasn't. In fact, in fact, the the uh, the, the results uh, is reversed. The more I drank, the more scared I became. The more the more I drank, the more lonely and desolate I felt. The more I drank, the more I hated myself. I don't know if you ever got to that point where I avoided looking myself in the mirror because when I did, I beat myself up like you son of a oh, uh, that I call myself names because of. Everything that I had done that I said I would never do. You know, you're growing up, you make fun of people who are uh, thieves and pimps and, uh, you know, the thugs. And I'll never do that. And you put your hands on your hips like, I will never do that. And, and the more you drink, you keep going down and down and down. And, and you do things that you never thought you would ever, ever do, you know. Let me tell you something. I was telling you a story for these boys at dinner tonight. That... Uh, uh, there came a time in my life to where uh, I got to Las Vegas. I burglarized the house in San Diego. I was in that house for about 45 minutes, trying on different suits. The guy was perfectly my size, and and I opened up a suitcase. I packed a really nice suitcase, and and uh, I, I was really paranoid at that time. And I went to uh, I went to Boss Depot, and I said, "Where's the next bus leaving?" He goes, "In 10 minutes. Where is he going?" Uh, Las Vegas. I said, "Give me a ticket." So I went to Las Vegas, and and uh, I, I had like four or five thousand dollars in stolen money and gold, and and I went through that in about two weeks, and and two weeks later, I'm walking up and down the, this street called MLK Martin Luther King, and they were cutting off trees. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I walked up to the guy and I said, uh, uh, "Can you give me a job? My wife is pregnant, and we have six kids." 
the guy, the poor guy was in tears. He goes, yeah, I'll pick you up tomorrow morning. What would you like me to pick you up? I said, right here in the corner. So he came and picked me up, the largest uh, asphalt company in town. And, and every, af- uh, every morning he picked me up, took me to work. And yeah, every afternoon he gave me 50 bucks. And he asked me, what do you want dropped off? And I told him right by the bar that I drank and where I got my other goodies. And, and, uh, and of course, I won the, the, where, where he was cutting the trees, there was four homes. Uh, abandoned homes and uh, it was a cold winter too and I would uh, roll myself in the carpet I took the carpet off the off the nails from the sides and I would roll myself in the carpet and so, so I won't freeze to death and and then I get home the following day and where's my house oh my the house is gone it's a pile of dirt they had demolished it so I moved to the next one and next one and the very last house that I was in had been in a fire I don't know if you've ever been in a in a in a place where it has been in a fire the, the odor is unbearable. And uh, it was me and another crazy guy, my roomie. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, never, we never got to find, you know, meet, you know, but we talked from a distance, like, are you home, honey? You know, make sure the door is locked. <laughs> and uh, one morning, uh, I was sitting, I was, this is, this is the story of my life. I, w- I would sit in a bathtub full of ashes and put a piece of cardboard box in front of me so the ashes won't go up my, my, my pants. And I would cover myself with ashes so I won't freeze to death. And it was about 5.36 in the morning when there was a uh, noise, voice, who said, uh, is anybody in there? We're about to demolish the house. And I ran out and it was the same guy that I had, uh, that, that was picking me up and taking me to work. And you want to talk about embarrassment, the shame and the, the pain of embarrassment. And we had an eye contact that lasted maybe two seconds. And, and of course, imagine having been in a bathtub full of ashes. I had a long beard that was all matted, not like, not like his, nice and groomed. I mean, it was all matted. And, and uh, my hair was long and, and I, was, I was filthy and I was disgusting. And, and we had an eye contact for a few seconds and... And the shame of embarrassment was so bad to where uh, I walked down the street. I had one dime called uh, the FBI. And I said, I'm coming in to turn myself in. And of course, they really, I mean, uh, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, Clancy says that uh, alcoholism is a disease of uh, perception. I add a little bit to that. We have identity crisis. Alcoholics have identity crisis. We seem to think, that it has to be Medi D T H E, the thug, the mafia member, the doctor, the engineer, whatever. I have to have a title in front of my name. Just being Medi as a piece of God is not enough. That's why when I was 22 years old, when I came to this country, I started smuggling narcotics. And I'm not talking about swallowing a bag and coming here and pooping it out. And yeah, I'm. I, I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, uh, the big, big, huge sums of narcotics. But when my uh, when my contacts got arrested, it was on national news. It was down rather at 5:30. Me uh, the, the news on uh, CBS. He said two brothers and a sister in uh, Houston, Texas, got arrested this afternoon for uh, smuggling uh, heroin. And uh, and I had one customer, and that was uh, Mexican Mexican cartel. You know, and I had I had lots and lots of money, but in here was just actually, if you have money and you have the disease of alcoholism, the uh, the the uh, emptiness, of, emptiness of alcoholism is even worse. It's more acute because now you have everything, but you don't have the very essence of your life, which is God. Okay, I swear to God, I never forget. I have I was telling Chris last night that I used to get these uh, these uh, cookies. The butter cookies and the blue tin cans. I had about 70, 80 of those full of $100 bills and 50s and 10s and 20s in the attic of my house. And, and in here, I was dying. I was dying of alcoholism. I was dying of the emptiness of alcoholism. And one day, I never forget, I was coming back from my ranch. And there was a guy, I think he was homeless. He had a backpack. He was walking on the side of the highway in Grass Valley, California, outside of Sacramento. And and I looked at him, and he looks he was, he looked so peaceful, and and uh, and I thought, God, man, if he's so peaceful, I wonder if I can be as peaceful as he is if I was homeless. And God was listening that day, and, <laughs> and 
shortly thereafter, I became homeless, and and it was more bearable. It was more bearable to be homeless and to have the disease of alcoholism than it was to have. That's why I always tell people, you know, why is it that uh, somebody as successful as Robin Williams uh, feels the need to uh, commit suicide? Why is it that somebody as successful as Michael Jackson, as popular as he is in the world, feels the need to have to have a shot in order to go to sleep? Because what they're missing is the very essence of their lives. Is God that is within them, but yet they're not feeling it. They're not feeling it. They feel necessary to go put a gun in their mouth and pull the trigger. You know, and it's so sad because all we have to do, God couldn't would if he was sought. All we have to do is ask. This has been repeated in this book. If you read chapter 6, step 6 in this book, it's as simple as that. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. He tells us that. He says, if God has the uh, ability, the power to take away your alcoholism, which is the worst mania of your life, don't you think he's gonna, he has the ability to take other things like sex, overeating, whatever, whatever, whatever other hang up you have? Of course he, he can, but yet, do we go to him for this kind of stuff? You know, it's like we limit his ability, like, well, he doesn't really understand accounting. He doesn't know money, you know, he's, he's an old god. He's still back in the day of like 200 years ago, 2,000 years ago. You know, he doesn't understand money, but yet he does. And all we have to do is ask, you know. So the book is, is saying that, uh, so I went to the FBI and, and I walked up there and, uh, and, and uh, I said, I'm coming to throw myself in. And he, the guy is, he was looking like, so what is he doing? I said, I'm like, come on, you got to have something in there. I had just robbed the financial institution. I mean, for God's sake, what more do I need to do to get busted? And he's like, I'm sorry, I can't take you. I was like, oh, shit. So he gave me five bucks and a cup of coffee and his card. I swear, it's a true story. It's a true story. He gave me five bucks, his card, and a cup of coffee. He goes, go get some help. Go get some help. And I didn't know where to get help. I was telling somebody, when you're not, when you, when you don't know, when you don't know what's going on, I was locked up for a year. Uh, on, on uh, one night of the week, they used to come and say, oh, Muslims are here. Oh, where do I sign up? I want to go meet the Muslims. Because I was raised in a Muslim household. I'm really not a good Muslim anyway. <laughs> but I went there. I went there like most of you, not good Christians, you just pretend like, Jesus, we love you, and <laughs> hallelujah, and... <laughs> But you know it's you know it's phony, you know I know I'm a phony Muslim. I don't I don't I don't face the East five times a day. I don't do none of that crap, you know. But I love God. I love God with all my heart because He loves me with all His. He loves me with all His. I know that to be true. He this man knows me. We him and I go back 33 almost 33 years. And he knows, he knows the stuff that I have asked God to do that he has done without saying no, without any reservation, without any conditions. I swear to God, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it from the podium because I don't want to come off as an egotistical puke, but stuff has happened in my life that you just sit there, you just scratch your head like, really? Is that possible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Of course, I do a lot of other stuff besides AA. I do AA. I do the 12 steps with all my heart, but I also do a lot of other stuff like, like I do yoga, hot yoga, and I do hot Pilates, and I'm 67 years old, and I go and jump up and down like I'm 17. You know, and I do that because I want my chakras to be open. I want, I want to be healthy. I want to, I want to do what's in the book, in the page 66 of this book where he talks about the seven deadly sins. I love the reader who, who read the promises because he takes care of himself. He's, it's obvious he, he eats healthy and he works out like I do. Of course, he's a lot younger than me, so he should. Right on, my brother. Keep it up. So when you're 67, you get to stand here. You get to stand on your feet for seven hours at a time in Iran and do read this book and break it down for, for people who don't have the privileges like you and I do, you know? So the book says... 
if you're to the point where alcohol is no longer give you the delusion of the light, then reach out and ask God why the way which is within you, you don't have to go to Tibet to find them. You don't have to go to India to find them. You don't have to go to Mecca to find them. He is within. All you got to do is clear the channel. He says it may be obscured by what? By calamity, by pomp, or by worship of other things. What is calamity? Calamity is hardship. The minute you realize you you don't have enough money to pay your, your bill for the month, fear. All of a sudden you feel the disconnect. You feel the separation with God. Pump is what? Being a pompous ass. Being, you look at me, you look at me, you look at me a, 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 a certain way and immediately I go, well, what are you looking at me like that for? Because I have an accent? Because I'm from Iran? Because I'm this? I'm, I just make up some story like a federal case against you because you looked at me funny. And you didn't look at me funny, I just perceive it as as, you know, you haven't looked at me funny, you know, in a resentment and worship of other things. And, and what is, what, is, what becomes the uh, worship for me to worship is a drink of a bottle of alcohol on two legs, female. You take the alcohol away from me and I go crazy with women like, like we used to do back in the day. I, I tell people that when, when we got sober, the, the topic every time we met was hot chicks and hot cars. And now every time we see each other, it's about prostate. You know? <laughs> How many times a night you go pee? <laughs> yeah, when I go to some of these meetings and the, the warm-up speaker keeps going and going and going, and I'm sitting there like, come on, dude, I gotta, I, I gotta end this in an hour, man. And my prostate is gonna bust open, you know? So, so the, the, uh, my, the, another problem that you and I have is, is the fact that uh, I have identity crisis and I want to have something in front of my name, something that, that, that's why, that's what ego comes in the picture. You see, when you and I are born as a child, by the way, the very best nine months of our lives are when you're in your, your mother's womb because you don't have any control over anything. And you know, you know deep down, you know deep deep, we must, that everything is going to come in on time, the nutrition, the oxygen, everything is going to be fine and dandy. You can fart, you can do whatever you want in your mom's womb, okay? And, and nine months later, you come to this world, you're still, you still know that you're a piece of God. And what happens is Aunt Julie and Uncle Tom come to see you, and by this time you're four or five months old, and they, oh, what a cute little boy, what a cute little girl, and they hand you a little toy, okay? And that's when the ego starts to form, okay? You become a piece of God, also the proud owner of this toy. And one toy, <laughs> serious business, that's a fact. And one toy becomes two and three, and next thing you know, you know, the, the ego has six compartments, okay? I am what I have. That's why when you and I meet, the first thing we do, we start talking about our, our uh, uh, you know, worldly uh, positions, like where do we live? I live in Spokane or whatever, or, or what is this area? This is a rich area, I imagine. You know, I live here, and, you know, I am what I do. What do I do for a living? You know, and we always exa exaggerate what we do, especially in the third world countries. Nobody is a janitor. Everybody is the chief janitor or the chief whatever. You know, they put... Uh, supervisor in front of their, their whatever it is that they're doing, you know. And, and uh, I am, I am uh, my accomplishments. That's why the minute we see each other, we want to make sure that you know which university I, I graduated from. And, and uh, the next one is I'm separate from you, which is a bunch of crap. You and I are the same. The greatest statement I've heard was from uh, uh, Albert Einstein, who said uh, the separation between you and I is nothing but an illusion. We've all come from the light. We've all come from the light. We're all the same. We're all the same, whether you're boy, girl, the black, white, Mexican, Persian, whatever you are, you have come from the light. So we're all the same. There's no separation. But, but every society, and it's not just in the U.S., if you want to see creation of separation, go to one of these games half, halfway. Okay, when it's halftime in a basketball game, when it's halftime in a football game, Go and listen to the coach to see how he's, how he's creating separation. What is wrong with you? You're a Texan. Like, oh, Texans are supposed to be superior compared to the uh, Washingtonians. What's wrong with you? You're, you're, you're British. 
You're, you're English. You're supposed to be like English are supposed to be superior than, you know, just separation, separation, separation. And they teach that in every country, in every society. The next one is I'm separate from everything that I want out of life, which is, again, it's a lie. Like if I want to have a big house or money or property or whatever, close closeness to God, all I have to do is get rid of my ego and everything will be at my fingertips. And this, again, again, I came from homelessness. I came from homelessness. I did not have a change of clothes. And Chris will tell you, I did no, no one ever handed me a one dollar a dime. Okay, I worked and I did, I did whatever I was, I was supposed to do. And consequently, I created a successful business. His grace again, his grace by getting rid of my ego. And of course, last and not least, uh, we're separate from God, which again is a lie. If God is within, what does he make you? He makes you a piece of God. Okay. So when we get to step two, there is more, there's more problems in the West world, in the Western world, like in Europe and, and, and the U.S. than it is in the Eastern world that people start having an attitude about God. And, and, uh, really, if you, if you look it around, like the, like the book says, uh, the, in the, the uh, chapter, what is it, uh, We Agnostics, he talks about it. If you really doubt if there's a God, go out and install at night and, and see what's going on. If you really doubt God exists, look at your own, look at your own creation. You and I come from a, from a tiny, tiny, uh, that, that seed from a, uh, about the size of a tenth of a head of a pin that swims, uh, swims through mother's uh, womb and, and goes there and becomes uh, becomes a heartbeat after a couple of weeks and after a couple of months starts uh, forming up as a fetus and and uh, nine months later we all come out and uh, we have nothing to do with it so everything comes from the spirit everything comes from from the everything everything comes from the light everything comes from the light and and I know I haven't had anything to do with this beauty that that I've been witnessing since yesterday here with all the trees and the the ocean and the, the mountains and the hills and the trees and and somebody has created all of this. You know, uh, uh, people who don't believe in God and I get that even overseas that no, 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 you've never heard the uh, the theory about the uh, the two atoms who that collided. And I say, okay, so who created the atom? Really? I mean, if there was two two atoms that collided and everything was generated was created. Who, who uh, created the first atom that, or the, the two atoms that collided together? You know, so there is, there is a spirit. Okay. And, and once you see that, once you see your own creation, once you see the creation of life, and if you have a problem with that, look how we get to Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know about you, but I, I did the, the, the year that I was locked up in county jail, I met a lady. I, I was working in the kitchen and I met a lady who, uh, uh, became my wife. Okay, she was an employee of the jailhouse. And I was going to be homeless once I get out in June. And she was not my type, but when you're homeless, types don't matter. You just settle for whatever is available. It's mean. It's really mean, but it's a fact. I got to tell the truth, you know. And uh, and uh, anyhow, she came and picked me up and took me home. And, and five months later, I told her she wanted to pay the rent and the, her bank account was had been emptied out by yours truly, and uh, I told her, I said, don't you see, I'm a junkie, I'm a drunk, what is wrong with you? And she said, let me take you to a treatment center. She took me to a treatment center, a treatment center, took me to three Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and when I left the treatment center, at the same time, I left her, and I moved to Los Angeles with the guy I had met in one of the jails, in the immigration jail, and this guy was not an alcoholic or a drug addict, and he took me to Los Angeles with him, he allowed me to use his car to get a job, and Two months after I had stayed with him, he goes, uh, let's go find you your own room so you don't have, because you want to smoke and, you know, I feel like you 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 don't feel the freedom to, to smoke in my house. So we went and got a one-bedroom studio, and this is what, what the book talks about, spiritual spiritual experience. Listen to this. I, I moved into a one-bedroom studio in Kenoga Park, California, right next to, to Los Angeles, and it's my second night in there. I get some brilliant ideas from time to time, you know, and, and I'm sitting there, it's about six o'clock at night, and, and I, it, it, all of a sudden it dawns on me that people who lived here, maybe they were drug dealers and they have a shitload of money that they forgot to take with them. 
So get up and look for it. So I get up and I'm going to the in the kitchen and pull all the drawers and behind the sink where we where we hide stuff, you know, on top of the cupboards and and nothing. I go in the bathroom, nothing. I come in the living room. There's a there's a bookshelf with three drawers. I pull the first drawer, nothing. I pull the second drawer. There's a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If that ain't odd, that ain't God. Here's a, here's a, here's a city of angels with hundreds of thousands of, of apartments, and I move into an apartment where there is not a Bible, but there is a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this guy, I know he missed it because it was all highlighted. All the, all the important stuff was highlighted. I was so disappointed that night. Like, sh- crap. You know, everybody, I'm, I'm such an unlucky guy that I find the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Two weeks later, I'm done. I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to go get me, a, get me a big bottle tonight and get me whatever I need to party with. And it's about 3.30 in the afternoon. I have a $100 in my, in my wallet, and, uh, and I have my buddy's car. And I was working for a drywall company, and I was way up there about, this, this, about 20 feet high. And because I was in a hurry, I didn't set that ladder right. And the ladder slid back down, and I came down face first. And next thing I know, how many fingers am I holding? What day is it? It was part of the fire department. They took me to a, a Simi Valley uh, hospital, and and uh, at, uh, a nurse, it was about 4 o'clock. The shift changed, and a beautiful blonde nurse came on duty, and she was assigned to my case, and she took me from room to room. And, and uh, at the end of the day, it was hardly anything, just a little scratch and a little bit bruised. And... She goes, how did you get here in an ambulance? She goes, uh, where's your car? I said, I had my buddy's car. It's on the job site. She goes, here's 20 bucks. Pay me when you can. And I said, okay. So two days later, I called her and I said, uh, can, can I come and pick you up? We'll go out to dinner on Friday. And she goes, sure. She was very pretty. So I want to pick her up. And I'm just a selfless guy. I can't help it. So so I picked her up and we went out to eat. And the, cocktail, the waitress comes and what would you like to drink? And she goes, I still, I said to mine, I had two, one of those uh, smoky tobaccos lined up or rolled up and ready to smoke. And I figured uh, I used to be a rich guy when I sold, you know, and I know how to impress you ladies, you know. And I figured I'd uh, order a couple of martinis, a bottle, uh, uh, after dinner cognac or something and smoke these. That's a done deal, man. I close the deal and we go home. You know, everybody's happy. At least I am. So with the, she goes, no, no, I don't, I don't just ice tea. I said, why don't you off tomorrow? She goes, yeah, I just don't drink. Now, remember, I had already been to three AA meetings, and I said, uh, wait a minute, is that, are you a member of ANA? She goes, yeah. I said, really? She goes, I said, how long are you sober? She goes, seven years. I said, what a coincidence. She goes, why? I said, me too. And she goes, she goes, how long are you sober? I said, uh, two and a half years. So we went to a meeting afterwards. This is the love of God. This is the spiritual experience that I'm talking about. If you cannot relate to your own creation, that how, how that you, you have been created from a tiny, tiny embryo, think about this. How did you get to Alcoholics Anonymous? Was it a coincidence or was it the love of God who showed you the way to the doors of AA? And then I walk into the basement of a church where we used to go and this is 1986. Being from Iran was not, we were not very popular at the time. We kept those, remember the hostages for, for 465 days? That Reagan, the day he came in, he said, if you don't release them, I'm going to beat the crap out of you guys, and they released them. So Persians, Iranians were in deep, deep doo-doo at the time. And, and I walk into a meeting, and, and I want to introduce myself as Ed, Eddie Lopez, because it's, I look like a Mexican anyway. So I sit down across from a, from an old guy that I learned so much from. His name was Jim Flannery. He passed away when I was sober 13 years. He was my sponsor. What's your name? I said, Mary Lou. What a pretty name. Where is that from? I said, I'm from, I was born and raised in Iran. I felt comfortable for some reason. He goes, Oh my God, my son in law is from Iran too. And, and all of a sudden there was a bond, immediate bond. He became like my, my dad and, and I learned so much from that guy. I learned, I, this is what I learned from you people. I've, I've learned to live and die with dignity. That's why 
I talk about oneness with God, it's not a bunch of crap. It's it's a fact. When I went to see my sponsor at the at the hospital and he is laying there, they had cut away his leg below the knee because of diabetes. Okay? I walk in there, he knows, he always smiles ear to ear, ear, regardless of the situation. And I said, that, how are you doing? He goes, I'm doing awesome. He goes, i got to show you something. I thought, wow, man, maybe he found the, the, uh, the pot of gold or something. He throws the sheet over, he goes, maybe he, he pulls out his, his stump, he goes, they only caught one. <laughs> like, really, you want to cook it too? You know, he's so excited that they only cut away one leg. He's, I, I got one more to play with. And I said, well, let me call my guys. I'm a contractor, and I got this. This is back in the day when we had two-way walkie-talkies, and I got my foreman on the, on the radio, and I said, go to this address and do a ramp. Where are, you, where are they taking you now? He goes, they're taking me to a, a rehab center to teach me how to operate a, a wheelchair. I said, Okay. And uh, I'll, I'll send the boys over there to, to build you a ramp so you can get in and out. And, and I went there two days later, and I said, uh, uh, to, how are you doing? He goes, oh, Mary, they told me they have to cut away this one too. And I told him, no, just take me somewhere where I can go be with my father. And he did. And he did. And the day, the day I went to see him, he was in coma for 12 days. And I whispered in his ear, his daughter was there, and I asked her to leave. I said, uh, would you leave? I want to I want to talk to your dad privately. And I said, uh, Jim, I don't know why you're holding on. I know you're not afraid of dying. You know where you're going. You're going back to the one with the light. I said, if you're worried about Vivian, don't worry. We keep an eye. Just please let go. We'll take care of Vivian. And an hour later, he left. This is This is what I've learned from the folks, man. This is what I've learned from you, to live with dignity and honor and to die with dignity and honor. My best friend became a guy from, uh, from Chicago named Frank Sweeney. Frank Sweeney was the most wonderful man next to, uh, to Jim Flannery I'd ever met. He walked in the room. He looked at you. He went. He was old. So nobody, nobody gave a crap because he was old, you know. So nobody take it, took it personal. They, they laughed because he was such a humorous guy. And if you, if you opened his heart, it was always full of perishable and he was going to somebody's house. Scott is in jail. His family don't have any food. I'm going to go deliver. He went to the Starbucks in Las Vegas and said, when do you, when do you get the new muffins and stuff? And they said on Monday morning, what do you do with the old? They would throw it away. He goes, don't do it. He went to like 10, 10 at, uh, Starbucks and he get a bunch of, a b- bunch of us guys to go to Starbucks every, every Monday and, uh, uh, take the, uh, the old muffins and we take it to the homeless and give it to the homeless. This is the kind of people that I grew up with in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why when, when I was told to go to Iran and I went to Iran and, and I started a, a Alcoholics Anonymous in my homeland of Iran. They had, at the time, they had Narcotics Anonymous. It was eight years, eight years old. It was hectic. It was bizarre. Narcotics Anonymous, God bless them. You know, it's, I don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> anyhow, I went there. I did a workshop, and uh, it was the March of 2003, and they called me back, and they said, would you come back again? I went back in October of 2003, and this time, they were set up with the, with the guy who uh, taped it, the seed made that at the time it was cassette tapes and, and, uh, AA began in Iran. And it hasn't been a piece of cake. It hasn't been like, it wasn't like where you're Gucci or Versace or, or Armani and, and go hang out with Chris and you're going to what, whatever Washington is Iran. You go places and like the first four or five years. I went there, and I, every every year I went and bought Tommy Bahama pants and Tommy Bahama shirts, and and I'm standing at a podium, and I got four thousand people in the room, five thousand people in the room, and most of these people can't even afford to eat meat, and I felt this big. So every year when I go to Iran, I go to uh, uh, Old Navy, and I buy a bunch of eight dollar pants and ten dollar shoes, and because I want to be one of them, I don't want to be the man from Las Vegas who's got money and who's got prestige. I want to be one of the guys, and I've gone there, and I, I went from city to city to city without knowing, like, 
like the, the phone will ring and say, oh, this is so-and-so from Shiraz. Where is Shiraz in the, the west of Tehran, west, west of Iran? And, and I go there not knowing what the heck is going on, and, and it, it started. And I have, I, have had, I have had stories, one story after another. And about uh, 10 years ago, a lady walked up to me and said, uh, you've saved my brother's life, and, and uh, you know, what would you like me to do in return? And I said, uh, what, what are you? She goes, I teach uh, uh, English. I have a, I have a doctorate in English. I said, would you, would you uh, uh, translate the books? And she goes, okay. So I gave her the five uh, AA books that, that are ap- approved, uh, Living Sober, uh, as Bill says, uh, 12 by 12, big book. And uh, that, uh, Dr. Bob and the good old timers, and she, she translated them, and I said, sent it to the GSO. Of course, GSO lost it, as they always do. And, uh, and uh, anyhow, but AA began, and, and I go there once a year, and coming here, Mark asked me, uh, would you like to get your own ticket? I said, I get my own ticket. If I can save AA 10 bucks so you can go to your central office, so be it. I said, I travel with the, uh, with the discount airlines. I'm not one of those guys who demands the first class and it has to be Delta. It has to be. I came with Spirit. Spirit compared to some of the domestic flights in Iran is like first class. In Iran, and I didn't know. In Iran, in Iran, when I went to Iran, I was at the airport and people are talking. The other passengers are like, what, what kind of air, airplane is it? It's Machabaf. You have some Russian name. That, and I'm listening to see what the hell they're talking about. And I said, so what is wrong with that? Oh, you haven't heard? Obviously, you're not from here. I said, no. Oh, there's about four or five of them fly out of the sky every year. I said, really? Well, it's good to know, you know. And Iran has been under sanction for 40 plus years, so they don't get parts for the old uh, 707s that they have. And, and I noticed that nobody would sit against the, by their window seats. And, and I found out when we were about 8,000 feet high, these Russian airplanes, they don't have enough insulation. So you get about seven, 8,000 feet, your, your, your legs are freezing. And the, 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 uh, the food trays, the, the overhead bills, it's like, what the hell? And this is how I started Alcoholics Anonymous in Iran. But I get, everywhere I go, I get anywhere from, from two to five, six, seven thousand people sitting, if they sit on chairs, not that they don't have chairs, they do, but if they sit on the Persian rose carpet, they can fit more people in there. And AA has begun. And I got stories to tell you guys, like, unbelievable. That's why I read what I read, the St. Francis's prayer, that if I die today, I'm going to be fine. Frank Sweeney, my, my buddy the, with, the, with the middle finger, he, uh, he was in the hospital, and he had gone blind. Okay, and the nurse walked in and she said, uh, "Hey, Frankie, I got good news and I got bad news." And, and he was blind and he was he was full of crap. He was so. What, what do you got, beautiful? I said, "Frank, don't lie. You can't even see how she, what she looks like. You know, you're, you know, see, I I always busted his his, his uh, testicles anyway. Every time he said, I'll, "I'll see you tomorrow," I said, "You can't even see him now, let alone tomorrow." <laughs> and she said, uh, "The good news is you're going home tomorrow." The bad put a catheter in you, and he goes, uh, again, he goes, uh, no, he goes, it's okay, take me someplace where I can die and be with my father, uh, again, and he squeezed my hands, one of the things Frank and I did, we used to go to the hospices, and how, how this began, and I talk about this because it's, it's important for the newcomer to know that your, your, your service doesn't have to end in AA, you can do service anywhere, okay? I got a call one day from a from a minister or something in one of these halfway houses and I, one of these uh, the, what is it the, the hospices and he says I understand you're Muslim and I didn't tell him no I'm not a good Muslim but I said okay he goes uh, we have a Muslim guy he's dying would you come and pray for him and I swore to God I didn't know how to pray in in, in Islam anyway so I went and said the third step prayer and. And whispered in his ear and like you know, let go and release and let go and God is good and he's waiting at the, the gates of heaven and the guy died. They called me up, they said, I don't know what you did, but the guy died. So <laughs> so I became I became the angel of death best friend. Okay. In fact, Frank used to tell everybody his wife got sick 
and Frank was at the hospice for five nights. The fifth day, I said, Frank, get the hell out. Let me do my magic. And, and I prayed, and, and she died that night. So Frank was, Frank was telling everybody, don't mess with Mehdi, because he knows the angel of death They're like this. So, so Frank squeezed my hand, and he said, uh, would you come and pray for me so I can go tonight? And, and I, as I was leaving my house, I told uh, my roomie, I said, uh, listen, uh, the lady that was staying with me, I said, uh, if I don't come home, come and look me up because his room is right next door to the nurse's station in the center of the uh, three-wing hospital. And I get there about 9 o'clock at night, and they're pushing his bed out. And I said, where are you taking him? Oh, and they took him at the end of a wing where there was nobody around. And, and when I meditate, I meditate very loud. You know, I want to make sure God hears me because he's old. So, and I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> Asking God, and I'm praying, like, take him because he's done so much for your kids. Uh, don't, don't let me down. Please take him tonight. And, and, uh, and he died that, that same night. He died that same night, you know. And uh, so one of the stories I'm going to tell is about Iran, that uh, these are the things that I, have, that I have experienced in Iran. That's why I read that prayer that uh, I know I'm going to be one with the light sooner or later. If I, when I stand in front of my maker, I have nothing to be ashamed of. I have made all my amends, okay? That same lady that was in uh, county jail who became my wife, I found her 20 years later, and she uh, informed me that she had my son. Uh, so a, a boy came into my life with a wife and a six-month-old baby named uh, Layla, baby girl named Layla. And uh, they became a part of my life, and... Uh, and uh, uh, about a year later, God gave him the second child, and uh, I went for the birth of the second one to Fairbanks, Alaska. And when Dina, the second one, was uh, eight months old, I get a call from him, and he says, Dad, I, uh, we've been deployed to Iraq. He was in the Army. And I said, you want me to babysit? He goes, yeah, would you? And this is the best chapter of my life. I was, at the time, uh, 57, and... Uh, they went to Iraq, and they left me with a two-year-old and an eight-month-old little girl. And uh, I had the privilege and honor of raising these kids. And this is Alcoholics Anonymous in action. This is becoming God-like. You see, the, God, the book is so vivid, so clear. We grow in the image and likeness of our own creator. Having had a spiritual awakening, what does it mean? We become more and more God-like each day. More and more God-like each day. That's why... When Mark called me, I said, no, I'll buy my own ticket, man. I don't, I don't really care. I come with the, with the discount, and I'll be happy to, to fly with, with Spirit. If, if $10 more can go to, this, to your central office, I'll be honored to do that, to become each, and each, each day more and more God-like. You know? And uh, some of the experiences I've had in Iran, I'm going to share a couple of stories about Iran, and then I'm going to shut up. Uh, I was in the city of Kermanshah, which is on the border of Baghdad and Iran, very close, and you could hear the bombs go off, and uh, everywhere I go, uh, everybody wants to invite me to their home for after the workshop, and they invite a few, and their, you know, their, their family members or their sponsees, and, and uh, a very good-looking guy came up to me, and he said, uh, uh, can I talk to you for a few minutes? He goes, I know a lot of people want you to sponsor them. Uh, that's not my case. I don't want to sponsor you. Do you want to? to sponsor me, he said, I just want to uh, share with you that uh, my name is Merdad, I'm sober 10 months and 14 days, and if there is one thing I regret, 10 months and 14 days ago, I was strung out on heroin, and I was a heavy, heavy drinker, and I had been listening to one of your CDs, and he goes, I went to the medicine cabinet and, and took some over-the-counter, I didn't have any heroin or any, or any booze, I took the over-the-counter medicine, and I fell asleep, and if there's one thing I regret, it was about 8.30 in the morning and my mother was waking me up and he said I was in the middle of this wonderful dream. I was up north by Caspian Sea where my parents lived the last 20 years of their lives. And he said uh, I was holding on to my belly. I was stumbling on the streets and a, and a guy came up to me and he goes, what's going on? What's wrong with you? And I said, I just gave up my heroin addiction and my drinking. And he goes, come with me. I'll take you to a guy who will fix you right up. And he goes, he grabbed my hand and we started walking. We turned the corner and there was a bright light on the middle of the street. And the closer we got to the, to the light, the less pain I felt. 
till I got to the center of the light. And when I got to the center of the light, my mother was waking me up, and I woke up with no pain. I woke up with no pain. And of course, I thought he was lying. I asked, I asked my host, I said, is he telling the truth? And they said, yeah, we sat up with them. We thought he was, maybe he was taking oxycodone or something. He said, they said, we sat up with them to make sure, no, he's not lying. He's, he's telling the truth. And he goes, uh, uh, by the way, uh, the other night when we came to the airport to pick you up, you were the guy in my dream. <laughs> yeah. Now, if I take it to, take it to Wells Fargo Bank, they're, they're not going to give me a penny for it, you know? But it's a memory that I'll die with and I'll be proud of because of what you have given me, okay? About a month ago, I get a call from a guy. Actually, it was a text message. He went to a 7 o'clock meeting, and there was a guy in the room with nine months of sobriety. And uh, the guy is a car thief, okay? And, uh, of course, he's a heroin addict and an uh, alcoholic, and, and he steals the car. And uh, it's one of those, what, what do they call them, USB? The, the, what is the flash? And, and yeah, he, it's a flash, and he puts the flash in. He's, he's all happy that he found this beautiful car that he just stole. And, and, uh, and he, he wants to listen to some music, and he puts it in, and it's uh, some, some bozo. My name is Midi, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and he pulls over, and he listens to it, and uh, he, he goes back, and he goes to uh, one of those they call them camp. They don't have treatment centers. They have camps. He goes to a camp. He gets sober, and he's talking about the miracle of his life. Uh, I was walking to Frank's. Opened up three half day houses in Las Vegas, and and uh, some of the old timers in Las Vegas they decided that uh, they wanted to go through the book. I do a lot of workshops. For some reason, about ten years sober, my life drifted towards doing workshops and retreats and. And, uh, and I was doing a workshop for the old timers at Fridays at noon at the Quest House, one of the houses he owned. And, and just as I was getting off my truck to go in to teach, my phone rang, and it was a guy from the same city, Kerman Shah. And he said, uh, you may not remember me. You don't know me. He said, uh, my daughter, I have a 12-year-old daughter. She uh, was coming from school. She was coming home from school, and the two of the little girls are talking to each other and says, uh, uh, yeah, do you have the, the CD of so-and-so, some, some singer, some Iranian singer? And she goes, yeah, yeah, would you lend it to me? And she goes, yeah, yeah, I'll give it to you when we go home. So they go home, and she hands them the, uh, one, of the, one of the CDs, and she takes it home, and she thinks she's going to hear some music, and she puts it in. And again, and the father is sitting there smoking opium and drinking vodka, and uh, she puts in the CD thinking the music is going to come on. And all of a sudden, my name is Mary, and I'm an alcoholic. And, and this guy called me up. It was his six-month sobriety date. And he goes, I just called to, to say thank you. And I get I get a, at least 50 phone calls from Iran every day. I, I can't answer all of them, as you may know. You know, I mean, we, we can only do what we can do. I'm not God. But I answer as many as I can. And and uh, this, is, this is my life, that you've changed my life. And this is all because what you have done with me. I don't, I don't take a better credit. Everything that I am, I am the man that I am because of your presence in my life. If they take you away from me, I'll be back sleeping in that same building or buildings like it where it had been in a fire, and I have to sleep in that uh, back ashes and cover myself up with ashes so I don't freeze to death. So thank you. Thank you. I can never know for what you've done with me. And again, thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.